next uh, next panel uh, is on subchapter five, uh, the small the, the new small business restructuring act. Uh, it's moderated by Bill Brandt. Uh, Bill has been. It says in his resume that he's been a fixture of the realist of the um, restructuring field for a number of years. Uh, the only gripe I have with that is Bill is not a fixture. He keeps moving and you find him in civic, political, and all sorts of other areas, uh, testifying before Congress and such. I've known Bill forever. He is just the most insightful, entertaining person. And I'm really looking forward to this session, not only because Bill and his great panel, but because the topic is one which I think we all know is important, but I'm not sure we all really know uh, enough about it. So Bill, let me hand it over to you. Well, thank you, Harold, and I appreciate your kind introduction. Um, may I introduce quickly, I know we have a limited amount of time, my panelists who are joining me for this nice panel on chapter on subchapter five. Uh, with me is Bob Keach from Bernstein Schur, who was one of the authors uh, of the actual legislation, along with a bit of my work. I have also Bill Harrington, who many of you know is the regional trustee for both New York and for New England. He's been kind enough to join us because so much of this subchapter five issue involves the appointment of the new trustees. And last but hardly least, I have the chief judge of the Southern District of New York, Cecilia Morris, who has been an advocate for this kind of reform for a long time. And so I'm pleased to have these three with me. I'm going to act more as a moderator as I start this I also say that uh, neither Mr. Harrington nor Judge Morris are speaking, as we would say in Rome, from the throne. Their, in, their uh, opinions are only their own, uh, and they do not reflect either the U.S. Judiciary or the Department of Justice. Uh, on the other hand, Keach and I, we just talk all the time, and it means nothing anyway, so that's where we go. I, I'd like to offer just a, a brief resume, and then I'm going to slip into moderation you know, in terms of getting and eliciting answers from the other guests. This, um, this subchapter five emanates from the ABI's commission on the reform of chapter 11, with Bob, which Bob Keach co-chaired with Al Togut. And I participated in for a number of years back in the early part of this last decade. One of the key recommendations coming out of that was to find a way to fix small and mid-sized businesses it was clear to all of us that the small business section of the bankruptcy code, which Judge Small in North Carolina, for example, and others have been focusing on, wasn't doing the trick. One of the things we were really concerned about is what we call barriers to entry. We were beginning to recognize that a number of people, mid to moderate sized businesses, including small ones, weren't filing chapter 11, because frankly, there was no way out with the claims trading environment and the way the world has worked since 1990. The fact of the matter is if they walked into their bankruptcy lawyer's offices and said, look, I'd like to put my creditors in a room and cut a deal with them and emerge at the other end with my equity or some form of my equity intact, that couldn't happen. And so what Bob and the others who worked on this legislation thought was, is there a way to, to leave an equity piece at the back end of this structure? such that we could reduce the barriers to entry? Can we also reduce the time and the cost? I've spoken at this distress conference now for eight to 10 years. What I constantly hear, and I think my panelists would agree, that everybody gripes about the time it takes in chapter 11, certainly the cost and all of the procedural rigmarole that goes with it. Could we streamline that a bit? So we basically were able to do this in this revised legislation, which passed in the, the House and the Senate in the late summer of 2019 was signed into law by President Trump on August 23rd, but had a very low cap as what would define basically who could be eligible for this. That cap was about $2,725,000. And that has everything to do with the fact that the way we were able to address this in Washington was approach the senators, especially the Senate staff, and talk about modeling something that resembled chapter 12 for farmers, where they got to keep, obviously, their equity at the back end, with a dash of chapter 13 thrown in. I'm pleased to say that through Bob Keach's capable work, when the CARES Act was passed in 
March of this year, we were able to raise the ceiling to $7.5 million, which obviously picks up a significant amount of additional eligibility. Our, work, our current thinking is something like 70 to 80 percent of the standard Chapter 11s may be covered under that basically ceiling cap for value. And obviously, if we get it raised further, it's due to sunset in late March, we might even do better than that. So that's the sort of the history of this. My own minimal part was this got hung up in Congress. There was not a great deal of taste for bankruptcy legislation. And many of you may re recall that last August in the summer, there were several other acts floating around Congress, which were going to be made law, including the Haven Act, which honored veterans, if you will, the National Guard Debt Reserve Act, as well as the Farm Family Farmer Relief Act. And what I was able to do on the Hill over the course of three or four eventful weeks was package all four of these as a take or don't take deal. And so with that, I was pleased to pay a small part in getting this done. But, but having said that, let me get my panelists involved. I've done my preamble. Let me turn to Bob Keats. Bob, you're the, one of the primary authors of this. You were one of the primary drivers on the ABI panel. Give us an explanation of how chapter, subchapter five works. Let us, you know, give us some idea of why it's different than your standard chapter 11. Sure. Thank you, Bill. Um, and, and, you know, thanks for your efforts in getting this done as well. The, um, um, yeah, let's do subchapter five in 10 minutes or less. We'll introduce the concept and then we'll, and then we will um, actually spin some of these things out as we go through the panel. As, as Bill pointed out, uh, the original subchapter five eligibility um, was for a debtor had, uh, had to be a person or entity engaged in commercial or business activity with aggregate, non-contingent, liquidated, secured, and unsecured debts. In other words, you do aggregate those things as of the date of the filing of the petition uh, in an amount not more than originally about 2.8 million. That's now not more than 7.5 million. Importantly, however, excluding debt owed to affiliates or insiders. Uh, and not less than 50% of that debt has to arise from the commercial or business activities of the debtor. Um, the important considerations there are that you exclude contingent and unliquidated debt, and you exclude debt owed to insiders or affiliates. The effect of that is that the aggregate debt of the entity can be a number actually quite a bit higher um, than $7.5 million, which, which extends the SBRA to what we might call middle market or at least lower middle market companies. Um, for example, and we'll talk about this later, there's some authority for PPP loans being excluded, things like lease rejection damages, guarantee claims. Uh, and so this, this actually moves the um, applicability of the statute sort of up market, if you will. Um, single asset real estate debtors are excluded. That's defined in, in the SBRA, but it's defined in sort of the typical way. Um, also excluded is any member of a group of affiliated debtors that has aggregate non-contingent liquidated secured and unsecured debt in excess of the 7.5 million. Uh, again, excluding debt owed to one or more affiliates or insiders. Importantly, this affiliate test, unlike the, the test for single entities, um, is not applied as of the date of the petition. So for most debtors, you determine whether they meet the debt limit as of the date of the petition. The aggregate test or the affiliate test um, is applied continually. So if, for example, you were to file an otherwise eligible debtor and then subsequently file an affiliate, and that was to bring the aggregate number over the top, both entities would then become ineligible for sub five. Um, if I could ask though, I mean, so let's sure. say you get to the, the, uh, the ceiling cap at 7.5. Is it, is it requirement that you stay in business? Is that the intent of this? Is it, does it preclude individuals from filing, for example? No, it's, it's actually not a requirement you stay in business, only that 50% or more of your debts arose from commercial or business activity. Although I think as we start talking about confirmation, it'll be hard to confirm, at least under the cram down provisions, if you're not still in business. But you make a very good point, Bill, which is it definitely encompasses individuals. And I think what we're hearing from the field, so to speak, is that most individual Chapter 11 cases, if they can fit under the limit, are now being filed as subchapter five cases. Um, the, you know, the two th important things are with individuals, are you under the limit? And again, an individual with a guarantee of, of corporate debt. Uh, 
right, of affiliated corporate debt um, will generally still qualify. And, uh, and uh, recognizing we're in a distressed investors yep. conference, the word guarantor and the importance of the fact that this is one way to deal with individual guarantees, which is so common in mid to small sized businesses, is a driving issue here, isn't it? Oh, yeah. I, I think that's what's driving, uh, I, you know, uh, based on a very sort of anecdotal survey, I would say that most of the individual subchapter five cases involve guarantors of corporate debt who file at the same time as their entities. Um, uh, importantly, um, subchapter five is a debtor in possession case. We'll get to the fact that there is what we refer to as a facilitating trustee, um, but it's a debtor in possession case. The debtor operates the business. The debtor is not dispossessed and the debtor in possession can only be removed from possession and operation for the kinds of things that now get trustees appointed, fraud, gross mismanagement, et cetera. Um, it's a, you, you elect to file under subchapter five. It's not mandatory. Um, and you elect by essentially checking a box on the petition. And we're almost past the period where this is relevant, but most courts have also allowed pre-existing 11 petitions to be amended um, to allow essentially a conversion to subchapter five. It's not really a conversion, but to allow the case to move forward as a subchapter five case where eligibility is met. Importantly, though, the seven and a half million dollar limit only applies to cases that um, were filed after the CARES Act amendment. So that uh, there's no reach back on that. So there, there's, no, there's no requirement, for example, that the business continue upon the filing of the Chapter 11, which I think no. is an important issue. Yeah. People can actually do this as, as winding up, their, you know, if they decide to throw in the towel to some extent. It can be done as a winding up. I, again, we'll, we'll get to it, but it might be hard to get the cram down other than consensually if you're winding up. But there's a way to do it. We can talk about it. And just um, and, and Bill, just if I can chime in there for a minute, there, there's... Sure. One of the other requirements that Bob mentioned was the engaged in business requirement. Uh, and there has already been some case law on that. Um, and I think courts have looked very broadly at what engaged in business is when you start, but that, that doesn't continue when you leave. You have to be engaged in business when you start, but there's right. no requirement at confirmation that you be engaged in business. Right, which might open the door to a going concern transaction or even an insider buying back his own business. I mean, there might be some ways to get there, but uh, that's a good point, Bill. Um, look, look, when I hit the big highlights, the presumption is there's no creditors committee. Um, it'll be the rare case where there is a creditors committee. Um, the court can appoint a creditors committee upon request or on its own motion. Um, but the presumption is there is no creditors committee, therefore no creditors committee counsel or other professionals. Um, a trustee is appointed, the subchapter five trustee, which is, as I said, a facilitating trustee. It does not operate the business. Um, I'm gonna leave the details for what the trustee looks like to bill. Um, but the only point I would make, uh, because some people I think were, you know, were frightened away by the idea that there would be a trustee is that the trustees who have been appointed have really um, adopted this facilitating role in the field. They're there, their primary mission is to facilitate a restructuring of the business if one is possible. And then we'll, we'll again, I'll let Bill fill in the details. Um, to, to Bill Brandt's efficiency points, the goals of subchapter five are to minimize time and expense of small business or you know, lower middle market organization. Within 60 days of the filing, the bankruptcy court holds a status conference and sets the schedule for the case. Um, and that schedule can be customized pursuant to that conference. 14 days prior to that conference, um, the debtor files a report detailing the efforts to attain a consensual plan. That status report, as Judge uh, Morris, I'm sure we'll get into, is not pro forma. It's an important document. And the debtor must file a plan 90 days after filing. And as we'll see as we move forward, um, that seems like it's a very short time, but it's not, frankly, um, a short time given what the default plan can look like. Critical, a critical distinction between subchapter five and the old small business provisions is there's no deadline for confirmation of the plan you filed. Um, the old statute had a deadline. Um, it was a hard and fast deadline. Um, it permitted essentially uh, a holdout creditor to essentially wait the debtor out. Um, and if you and if you missed the plan confirmation deadline, um, your fate was probably dismissal or conversion. Um, in sub five, only the debtor is allowed to propose a plan. Exclusivity um, is essentially always present. Um, 
We've done away with this separate disclosure statement. There are certain disclosure statement elements that have to be in the plan when it's filed, but you solicit acceptances by virtue of this enhanced plan. Um, and, and again, there's a form that can be used. It's pretty streamlined. Um, the plan has to include a brief history of the business ops of the debtor, a liquidation analysis, and critically the projections with respect to the debtor's proposed payments under the plan. Um, there are opportunities for, this goes to Bill's point about individuals filing. There are opportunities that exist only in subchapter five um, to modify a first mortgage on a residence, for example, when that mortgage has been taken out to finance um, or a partially finance operations of the business. Um, to move quickly to confirmation and then expand it to the whole panel as we talk, confirmation... If yeah. I can just ask you one question, again, yeah, sure. this best investing. Abs the absolute priority rule is something that everybody in the industry understands. How does the absolute priority rule affect subchapter five or does it? Well, perfect segue, right? Two of the things that everybody's used to in chapter 11 that we were determined to get rid of in small business chapter 11 um, were the inability of, um, of closely held equity to retain their equity without paying everybody in full which was a real, as you pointed out, a real inhibition to filing, a big barrier to entry. Um, the other was doing away with the requirement of an accepting impaired class. So um, confirmation in subchapter five has the same elements as 1129A currently has, the confirmation section, with the critical exception that if the debtor proceeds under the special SBRA cram down provision, which essentially um, requires the devotion of net disposable income, think in business terms, net operating income um, towards the payment of debt for a three to five year period. If you choose that, um, uh, that cram down option and you are successful, you do not need to obtain the acceptance of an impaired class of creditors. Um, secured creditors are treated the same. They still have their 1111B election. A critical element is an SBRA debtor can pay its administrative expenses over that same three to five year period. Um, if the plan's consensual, the debtor gets its discharge right away. Um, if it's non-consensual, discharge comes with the completion of payments. To Bill's point about the absolute priority rule, equity holders can retain their interest in the business even if the plan does not pay unsecured claims in full and the absolute priority rule is otherwise not met. In other words, because some class did not accept the plan. As long as the plan does not discriminate unfairly and is fair and equitable with respect to impaired unsecured creditors. Fair and equitable has a special, I refer to it as a safe, har safe harbor provision, which means uh, that the plan is fair and equitable if the debtor commits all of its projected disposable income or property of an equivalent value um, to make payments under the plan for a minimum of three and a maximum of five years, right? So if you project out and you pay projected disposable income over the three to five year period, um, you can cram down um, your creditors and retain your equity interest. The, the property of equivalent value provision is interesting, especially for an investment conference, right? Um, what this allows you to do is project what your payments would be over the three to five year period. And if you can raise that amount, you can pay the net present value of the mat, that amount at a, at a lump sum at confirmation and receive an immediate discharge. Um, that means that there's probably a lending proposition here or an exit finance proposition um, for people to essentially fund that net present value. Um, so Bob, before yeah. I move on to, to Bill real quickly, the, the question has arisen, is a guarantee of a wholly owned entity's debt, a personal debt included in the $7.5 million cap or is, or is only an affiliated affiliate's debt excluded from the cap? How do you see that? Again, is a guarantee of a wholly owned entity's debt, a personal debt included in the 7.5 cap, or is it only an affiliate's debt and excluded from the cap, if you will, thinking to the guarantee issue? You mean, a, you mean the guarantee by the person who holds the shares? Yeah, I would assume so, right. Yeah, I, it, I, I think it's insider debt. It's probably also contingent, so it's probably so excluded. Excluded from the 7.5 cap, which gives you room, as you say, to expand the cases. One other thing between you and I, before I kick it over to Bill, we've been getting some questions about the fact that we know that your handiwork on the CARES Act 
sunsets on March 27th of 2021. And obviously it would not be good for all of us to see the cap revert to a 2.7 or if it's indexed to 3 million. I think the, uh, the larger audience should be aware of unofficially that there are several people with oars in the water who think that even 7.5, if we're going to do another round of stimulus, might increase a bit. And, and, uh, and if it does increase, let's say 10 or 15 million, just as a throw out number, you'd be picking up probably somewhere between 85 and 95% of most of the numerical 11s that would be filed. I mean, that would be well within the, within the boundaries of the, of the uh, except for the mega cases. So let me, if I can turn to Bill Harrington for a second. Bill, um, the subchapter five seems to provide an approach to the role of a trustee which is an entirely different perspective than the sort of adversarial trustee we're looking for in the standard chapter 11. Can you talk about how you see the trustee and what your office is doing to facilitate all this? Sure. Um, and I'm not sure I'd call a standard trustee adversarial, but, oh, yeah. I, but, I, but I would say um, this is an entirely new trustee. And in some respects, I, I, sort of wish we hadn't called it a trustee uh, because I tried. I, I tried, Bill. I tried. <laughs> I do think that creates some confusion with respect to an operating trustee. So in a traditional chapter 11 environment, uh, should there be cause, which we all know, you know, is yeah. fraud, dishonesty, and mismanagement, you can put in an operating trustee who supplants debtors management. Here, we're talking about an entirely different thing. Um, I, I've referred to it sort of colloquially as a consulting trustee, because as Bob said, the debtor stays in possession. So the debtor stays the doer, the debtor's attorney stays in as the legal advisor for the debtor. Um, and then you have a consulting trustee who can assist the debtor uh, and provide some financial advice, some um, some lending advice or, or whatever the case calls for. And so we had the option to either do standing trustees or case by case trustees uh, under the legislation. Because this was brand new, we didn't think it appropriate to do standing trustees. Um, we decided that we couldn't set up budgets, we couldn't set up offices for standing trustees right away. And we may do that in the future, but for now we've set up pools of case by case trustees. And I say pools, not panels. So different from the chapter seven context where it's on a wheel and you just get the next trustee in rotation. Um, we specifically get to select from our pools, the individual trustees for individual cases. And we try to match up the needs of the particular case as best we can with what we know when, we, when the case files um, with the trustees who are in our pools. And so these are consulting trustees. There is a trustee in every case. You can't not get a trustee. We've had people call us before a case is filed and ask us if we could waive the trustee requirement and just not appoint one. That's not possible. You get a trustee in every one of these cases. But the role of that trustee is going to be different in every one of these cases. As Bob said, the primary role of the trustee is to facilitate a consensual plan. And the hope in every one of these cases is you'll get to a consensual plan, uh, whether that needs the trustee's active intervention in a case because their creditors um, need, you know, confidence in the debtor and the trustee can help provide that with based on its independent analysis of the case, or whether it's a really light touch. We've had cases where trustees have done almost nothing because the case came in pretty much set up. There was a deal with the creditors and the trustee had a very soft touch to carry it through. So there's a lot of different roles of the trustees. Our panels, our panel trust, our pool of trustees all have varied experiences. And so we try to cover the specific industry. So we try to find a trustee if they've got healthcare or they've got manufacturing experiences, we try to tailor that trustee to a case. Um, so it really comes down to the needs from a particular case. It is a consultant who can help the de debtor with their business operations, with their financing needs. Uh, and its primary role is to facilitate a consensual plan. So, so Bill, you know, who are these people? Are they lawyers? Are they accountants? How many of them are there when you say pools? For example, in each district, what's the, what's the likely size of the pool you're seeing and how do they get paid? And, and it varies by district to district because we have a different expectation of how many cases we're going to be filed um, in various districts. 
um, for, so I have two regions. I have region one and region two, and I have a pool of 10 trustees in region one that covers the entire region one. And so I can pull a trustee from any um, geographic location throughout region one. We've got a sort of- in Region one spread. is basically New England other than Vermont, right? Is that correct? Right? Okay. And then region two is Vermont, Connecticut, and New York. And I have three panels of trustees in region two, one for the Northern part of region two, um, one for the Southern part of region two. And then Connecticut has its own panel because Connecticut is geographically sort of separated from the rest of it. Um, and each of these panels has between uh, five and 15 people on the panels. And our, our panelists are, are members of the pool are, um, there are some lawyers, there are some chapter seven trustees, there are many financial advisors, um, and there are accountants. So we have a wide variety of experience and they have experience in a wide variety of industries. They have- How did you find them? But did they find you? They found us, we advertised uh, and, we, and we conducted um, a very extensive interview and vetting process. Um, and our primary concern was we wanted people with operational and financial experience. And so even if we have lawyers on our panel, they are people who come with a, you know, a broad array of sort of business, operational and financial experience. If I can ask you, Bill, what do you see, how, what are their duties? I mean, obviously we've talked about the fact there's this panel of trustees to facilitate, as Bob said, how do you see their duties? What are they supposed to do? Well, as there are a wide array of different cases that, that can elect to, sub, to use subchapter five, there are individual debtors um, who have no idea how to put their finances together and how to do reporting requirements. You know, they may keep their receipts in a shoebox and you need a accountant type or a financial advisor to come in and organize their records. To, as Bob said, you can have a relatively good size industry here if you if you remove kind of insider and um, affiliated debt or non contingent debt. You can have a you know manufacturing company that does you know fifteen million dollars a year in revenue, and they may need some advice with you know getting financing or or securing exit financing or negotiating with their primary creditor who has become frustrated with the debtor over time and now needs an independent party who wants to take a look at the case and can say, I know you've had trouble with this debtor over time, but I've looked at the numbers they're projecting now, and this is really a case that could work, and they can provide that sort of buffer between the debtor and the creditors in a case and getting to a consensual plan. So the role is gonna be very different depending on the needs of a particular case, but their primary duty is to uh, facilitate a consensual plan. So they can do that by helping negotiate with creditors. They can do that um, by providing some financial advice if that's required in the case or some advice as how to you know, secure financing in a particular case. And they also add a benefit, I think, for the court because they provide an independent analysis of the case. As Bob said, you're gonna have to file a status report 45 days from the petition date, advising the court as to what you're going to do to get to a consensual plan. If that's a pie in the sky report that doesn't really have any grounding in fact, you'll have an independent trustee who can tell the debtor, no, you're gonna to have to change this and this and advise the court at the 60 day status conference, You know, these are the things that are gonna to have to change for this case to go forward. So the role can be very different depending on the needs of a particular case. A couple of things to sort of wind up where you are. The uh, small sub, sub chapter five cases do not usually have creditors committees. I'm assuming that I haven't seen any of them so far with the creditors committee. They're not prescribed, but they're basically, um, if you will, you know, the thought was to kind of see if we could get by without them. I also recognize that the uh, the trustees on the pool are not permitted to hire counsel generally without grave exception. And the last issue to throw at you is. Do these trustees ever become the chapter 11 trustee if it doesn't work out right? So 
Um, I'll take I'll take them in order that you ask them. Creditors committees are disfavored and they're only appointed if the court finds cause for the appointment. And so they're not generally, and I'm not sure we've had a subchapter five case that has a creditors committee yet. I don't think anyone's moved for the appointment of a creditors committee. Yeah, Some Bill, the, 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 the only one I've seen, Bill, just to jump in is where you had a transition case that was a regular 11 and they elected to proceed under sub five after passage. And the committee was in place and the court kept the committee in place. But that's the only case I'm aware of. Yeah. And I have not seen another case where someone actually moved during the course of the case for a, for a committee. So, I, I, you know, we have about 1,400 cases now. So uh, that would be a very low percentage of cases where you have okay. one transitional case that well below, you know, 0.1%. So, um, so your, your second question was addressing... The trustees hire lawyers. Hire lawyers. And they can in very rare circumstances. But as we told our trustees when we trained our trustees, we hired our trustees for their expertise, not for them to go out and hire lawyers to provide expertise or to hire financial advisors if they were lawyers. And so we think it's a very rare case. And typically, I think you would only see it in a case where the court expands the duty of the trustees to do something else other than the regular duties of the trustee for, you know, facilitating a consensual plan. If there was tasked with, you know, looking into liens or something like that, or selling a particular asset, um, or in the case of, and you talked about, can they become an operating trustee? Under 1185, the debtor can be removed from possession. And in that circumstance, and they are the same kind of criteria you'd see with an operating trustee in a chapter 11. If there's fraud, dishonesty, or gross mismanagement, those are the kind of things that can tri trigger the removal of the debtor in possession. If that happens, instead of appointing a chapter 11 trustee, the sub chapter five trustee moves into the role as an operating trustee and can operate the business. Uh, and so in that case, you can't have an 1104 trustee in a subchapter five case, but if you remove the debtor in possession, the subchapter five trustee can operate the business as a subchapter five trustee with a debtor in possession removed. Yeah, though, oh, Bill, an, an important distinction though is that even when operations switches to the subchapter five trustee, the subchapter five trustee still can't file a plan, right, for the debtor. Yeah, the so debtor. In, in all likelihood, the disposition of that case is probably going to result from a dismissal or conversion, don't you think? As opposed to a plan. I would think so. Although the debtor could file a plan with the trustee in operation, I suppose. I guess if the if the trustee could restore kind of balance to the operations and the debtor could then be placed in a position to retake over and have a plan and or file a plan that's in the benefit of the debtor, I think there there's a possibility, but I think the likelihood is you're probably going to get to a conversion or dismissal. And that may be post-sale of the assets because the trustee right. could sell the assets as well. Right. So, so with all that said, let, let's turn to a more final word on all of this. My, my good friend, Judge Morris, I, I've sort of built the expectations that by discussing how this came about and, and how the U.S. trustees office sees it. But Judge, you're, you're a longtime advocate of, of small business and mid-sized business reorganization. As Bill Harrington said, there's now somewhere between 12 and 1400 that have been filed. I noticed that about 26% of the ones filed so far involve individual chapter 11 debtors, which if you think back on it, was probably a, a good way to have that, make it easier to file chapter 11 trustee or individual cases. But what's your thoughts on this so far? Do you, do you like the facilitators as the, as, the, uh, as the trustees are prone to be? Do you like the way this is set up? How do you see this helping the court? Oh, thank you, Bill and Bill and Bob. It's interesting for us to be together again. For those that don't know, the four of us have been on two or three panels together before this really, or right as this was going live. And now we've got some uh, cases under our belt. And uh, Bill Brandt, I, this is a godsend to many of these individual 11s and small business. And when I'm talking about small business, I'm talking you, we're, this was even before the 75, uh, uh, 7.5 million. Uh, these, these are incredible. These businesses quite often, the ones we're talking about, um, need a 
business minded accountant, not a bookkeeper. And I'm not disparaging accountants, but sometimes they come in and their books and records are okay as books and records, but no idea how to move forward. And I want to do some kudos to the U.S. trustee program for the, for the um, trustees that are at least appearing in front of me. And now I have some personal knowledge. 39 of these cases have been filed in the Southern District of New York. I have six of them. Of those six cases, one was an individual, several small businesses, a power generating company, a real estate development company, an amulet services, a construction company, and a retail clothing store. The And the retail clothing store was quite large. Uh, Bob Keach and I may talk about that a little bit more, but the construction company ended up converting to a seven. And I'm sure that had a lot to do with that they were getting advice, not only from their lawyers, but from the trustee. The same thing, the trustees we've had, as Bill said, seem to be the consulting trustees. They appear at every hearing, they file their reports, but they definitely are there to help. And it's been, um, it's been a godsend. Let me just put in a plug here too. I know we talked about this before, <clears throat> about how during COVID, this would be a uh, godsend to some of these small businesses. I still think it could be a godsend. What we are seeing primarily is um, the average lawyer is struggling to understand the subchapter five. And I think we're just now coming to fruition with that. It takes a while for a new law. I don't care how wonderful it is or how good it's gonna be for their client for it to begin to take effect for people to understand what they're doing. And so I, that's pretty much in the position we're in right now. I did do a little survey of my uh, lawyers to see what they thought the ones that were filing, and they said exactly what I said. I'm only saying what they do. So we now have some hindsight. I know it's limited, but the hindsight I have is this could be critical for the economy of the country if it could take off and these small businesses could, could um, use this as a way to come to the court. There were two or three things that y'all talked about that were really important. For instance, if you have any dealings with a small business, the first thing you know is, and I saw it last night on that program where Mark Cuban is, I was switching through, flopping through the channels and it's what is some kind of business. And his first question to one of the people, it says, you, you put $350,000 into this product. He said, yes. And, and, and Cuban then asked him, how did you do it? He said, um, and, and Cuban said, you didn't mortgage your home, did you? And the guy said, yes, I did. And of course, that's what you get in these small businesses. They come in and they need collateral. What do they do? They go mortgage their house. And that is one of the prime examples of how this could work because it is mortgaged and they can trace it back that it went to the business. So those are the kinds of things. Um, I, I We've really been pleased with it. Um, so I want to ask any you. specifics. Yeah. Yeah. Judge, I had, I had a quick question. One of the reasons I so value you participating in this panel is that, you know, the Southern District of New York is not just New York City. It's Westchester, it's Poughkeepsie and other places. And, and the variation between, you know, the kind of cases that are filed in Manhattan versus those that are filed in Poughkeepsie gives a real good indication, I think, of just how viable this is. You're talking about the cases that are filed up in Poughkeepsie. How do you see the difference, you know, this working in Manhattan versus more rural areas? I, I think that might be a little bit of a misunderstanding. There are a lot of the cases filed in Manhattan, uh, you know, in Manhattan also, because you look, there's so many small businesses that have been affected. And honestly, we've tried an outreach to particularly minority communities. There's a real I don't, the wealth is the wrong word, but there's a real um, cluster of businesses that need the financing, need to get through this, this, this whole COVID thing and could use a reorganization such as this. The cost for the um, debtor is dramatically less than just a 
for want of a better term, a regular chapter 11 and, and an individual chapter 11. It's too expensive even for an individual. And this, this really is, and their debts are no more than uh, what we have in the, in the limit on these cases. So perhaps I was inelegant in the way I asked the question, but I was referring to the fact that the ABI, as all three of us and all four of us know, has published some statistics about this, which indicate that the number of Chapter 11 filings in the country over the last, you know, since through October 30th, about 20% were taking advantage of some Chapter 5, and that's just since March. But if you look at some of the more rural areas, Nebraska, Vermont, and the others, you see that the entirety of their case filings are these subchapter fives, which represent sort of how the rural environment is. And that's why I was phrasing the question, because it does appear that in some states, especially where there is less business activity in lower urban areas, this is becoming the bulk of the filings. And, and I think Bob and Bill will only become a higher bulk if we raise the caps to 10 to 15 million. Oh, no, I, I agree with you there. And I and now I understand your question a little better because I agree. What happens e even in the area uh, north of New York City, and I'm including Westchester on this, Westchester has usually higher debt. But if you go to the other counties within the- You lost state, your mic there, Judge, for a second, I think. Excuse me? We lost your mic, uh, lost the audio. Judge, can you hear us? I can hear you perfectly. Um, you I don't have your audio, so. I, I can hear her, Bill. I can hear. Yep. Hmm. That's, Bill turns me off. He turns his hearing yeah, aid right, off. So so that's right. We'll see what happens. Re resume as, as, as you were I'm, doing. I'm, yeah. Well, okay, see, Bob? I, what I, I um, agree with Bill in, to a certain extent, because the rest of the Southern District of New York outside of Manhattan and in the pocket in White Plains, reflects the rest of the country. And this area is prime for these. Uh, the biggest problem we have, and I think Bill will uh, appreciate this, and Bob too, because they're in certain areas, is getting lawyers to understand how to do it and to take it and do it far with them. Uh, can you it. hear me now, Bill? I can. I can. I had a, a minimal lot. And we're all doing this internet thing for the first couple of times. And as I explained to everybody, and Bill Harrington knows this by heart, my VCR is still blinking midnight. So I'm I'm way behind in the uh, electronics curve here. But I think I've got it all back on going. So can I, yeah, I, I, I just follow up on what Judge Morris said for a minute. Because sure. um, I, I think it was an excellent point. And I think now that we're eight months into this, this new legislation, I think we're starting to see an uptick in cases because I do think lawyers are becoming more comfortable with it. And any fears that the lawyers had about the trustee running sort of rush roughshod over the case and, and not being able to run the case they want to run the way they want to run the case. Or, or the paranoia that the trustee is a trustee in waiting, Bill. That's one of the other issues. Exactly. I've and I don't think we've seen that. And I think that the legislation has worked exactly as it was supposed to work. Um, I think we've seen a higher percentage of these cases confirm than we had seen in small business cases prior to the legislation. Um, we're only eight months in and we have, you know, somewhere between 10 and 15 percent of the cases that have filed confirmed. Uh, that would have been something that would be a year and a half or two years under the prior small business legislation. And you wouldn't have been at 10 or 15 percent. You would have been somewhere at one to and Bob can correct me, one to 5% on the, on the upside. So we're seeing these cases confirm faster. We are seeing the trustees adopt their role to the particular case and the fees of the trustees not being a huge expense for the cases. Uh, they've been appropriate for the size of the cases, which the courts can regulate through 330 applications. Trustees have to file 330 applications just like any other professional in a case. Uh, and these cases are working. We're getting these cases through the system faster and they're getting confirmed. Uh, let, and so let, I let me chime that's in. what we were looking Bill, for. Let me chime in, Bill and Bill, let me chime in. Uh, we're batting 500. My well, court is batting 500. And I am so proud of that. Even DiMaggio didn't get there, speaking of it. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, and you think about it, though, uh, Bill Brantz, this describes, my court describes what you're talking about. It's in a particularly rural area. The I do have some trained Chapter 11 lawyers because it is also close to New York City. 
So we do have those two combinations. So we're one has converted to, to seven. And even with the conversion to seven, we're batting uh, 500. That's amazing statistic for confirmation in any chapter within the bankruptcy code. Well, let me yeah, see. I mean, the, the anecdotal evidence is certainly that confirmation rates, as, as Bill Harrington pointed out, are way up, right? Um, well, I, I also think the information, as Judge Morris pointed out, on efficiency is good. Um, there's certainly some exceptions. Um, we know where uh, there are always going to be cases where somebody says too much was spent or uh, fees were too high. But And since I spent a fair amount of time, as Bill knows, as a fee examiner, we, that's not unique to small cases either. Um, but, but my sense is that the efficiencies are actually working, um, that the cost is, as Judge Morris pointed out, remarkably lower. The time to confirmation is much shorter. Um, and I think in that respect, it's working the way we intended. Um, and as you pointed out, Bill Brandt, um, if, um, if, if certain people, including some people on this call, are successful in extending the sunset at the very least, or extending and increasing the amount, um, even just matching the current Chapter 12 debt limit of 10 million, right, would, yeah. um, would expand the reach uh, considerably. You'd be talking about an excess of 90% of cases by number filed in the United States. That well, that was, that was the question I was going to pose to all three of you. I mean, it, it looks like it's working. I, I asked Bill Harrington and the judge to comment first. Um, there was some skepticism in some quarters about whether it would work to start with. Are you now believers and would you like to see, for lack, you know, for lack of a better way of saying it, the program expanded with a higher debt limit, not ridiculously high, but something that, that is reasonable for mid and small sized businesses, which is in the 10 to $15 million range. Bill? No? Um, I'll stay out of um, congressional legislation <laughs> as to whether what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. But I will say the the both uh, statistical evidence and anecdotal evidence that we have seen at the U.S. trustee program is that it is working. And, and Bill, and let, let me add something to that, what you ahead, just Judge. said, and, and also what Bill Harrington said. While it's not a matter of staying out of it, I I do know when you look at a family farmer and you know they've got two or three combines or one combine, two at the most, they've reached almost that debt limit or close to it. I, I can't make that argument. Somebody else needs to make it. Somebody that does deal with these cases um, and, and see, you know, and say, the, if you have the rent, if you have this, if you have that, whatever you have, uh, for instance, if you're a small grocery, how much are your refrigerator units? What have you got? Then I think that argument can easily be made. And I agree with you, but I only agree with you anecdotally. I don't have some hard sure. information to agree with. Yeah. And Bill, as you know, when we were trying to get this through Congress together, right, um, we, we were proposing the same $10 million debt limit that was in the Chapter 12 bill. And, you know, we've heard a lot lately about politics being the art of the possible. Um, you know, we got what we could get, um, which was the $2.8 million threshold. I will say that it did not take long to get bipartisan agreement once the pandemic began to hit and, and the impact on small business was quickly realized. And we pretty quickly got bipartisan support to move the number to $7.5 million with a sunset. Um, I expect that there'll be that same bipartisan support to at least extend the sunset. Um, although, you know, you can go broke predicting Congress, so I'm not going to you know, make a lot of bets on that. But I do think there's, you know, bipartisan support to extend it. I think there's a realization that it's doing a lot of good. I personally would like to see us achieve our original $10 million goal, at least, um, because I do think it's working and I think it could help a lot of people. Having said that, I would encourage everybody and, and particularly the lawyers are going to handle these cases to really look hard at the eligibility rules and the exclusions, right? Um, you know, if, you're, if you have the right case, given the exclusions for insider debt, given the exclusions for contingent and unliquidated claims, and as I said, it's been found, it's a very well-reasoned decision, um, the parking management decision out of the District of Maryland that excludes PPP loans um, until the forgiveness determination is made. Um, from the debt limit that excludes lease rejection damages from the debt limit. Uh, we've talked about how guarantees could be excluded as contingent liabilities. Um, 
if you look carefully, you may find that the statute applies to much larger enterprises than you think um, and is, is already useful, but it certainly would even be more useful if the number were a bit higher. I think as well that the, the unsung uh, aspect of this is the individual chapter 11. So all of us who did reasonably sizable, mid-sized individual chapter 11s, real estate developers and the like, had an impossible time because of the absolute priority rule. And, and this, this helps a bunch get, get it done. So well, Bill, you'll recall, Bill, that I wrote an article about individual chapter 11 called Dead Man Filing, yeah. um, <laughs> which was my opinion of how good individual chapter 11 was. This is obviously a considerable improvement um, if, for anybody. If, if the death ceiling gets lifted and the and we continue, um, I would think that this will become the refuge of most individual Chapter 11s. Bill Harrington, I've got an inevitable, inevitable question here. How does one apply to become a trustee in one of your pools? Um, similarly to how we how we advertise for Chapter 7 trustees. Uh, and so as as more cases file and we need to expand the pool, we will do more advertising. Uh, so we had an initial pool is what we called it. You know, we didn't know how many cases we would have. So we wanted a pool big enough so we could cover the number of cases and have a diverse group of people who have experience. Um, as, as our trustees start to sort of get too many cases, so we need to add to our pool, we will advertise uh, and we will be thinking about accepting new trustees. Judge Morris, you know, I, one of the things I always find interesting about this is that the absolute priority rule doesn't apply. I mean, as you sit on the bench and you work through the confirmation of these cases, do you, do you regard that particular aspect of this subchapter as a godsend versus what you normally have to deal with? How do you see oh, that? I, you're talking to someone that has status conferences and everything all the time. So I, I keep asking that question. But I, I find that these, the, as you see, I've already, we're already batting 500 up, up here. So we've, we've got them moving and they're moving rapidly. I, I think that has to do with two things, the, the trustee and the um, uh, debtor's attorneys in these cases. Uh, absolute priority rule, you know, if, if they're going to come in and start protesting, that's another story, but I don't have that yet. There might, there was probably going to be an outlier at some point that someone's going to come in and say they haven't done anything. What are you doing, Judge? Uh, but it's almost a wash at this moment, at this moment. And just from the bench, Judge, are you seeing, as Bill Harrington would hope that you would, are you seeing that the debtors are getting uh, decent guidance? There's a set of training wheels, if I could phrase it that way, that Bob was talking about for the debtors who normally, you know, we always talk about the fact when you get into Chapter 11, there's really two businesses. There's the business you were doing and there's a business of Chapter 11, which are vastly different. Ha have the trustees acted as, you know, in a facilitating way as you would have wished them to so far? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I have one in particular, and Bill will know who it is, uh, that I, we, we've already got the lawyers sort of turning to him. Because our lawyers, just so you know, we have some very good lawyers, but the sophistication level with the financial aspect, uh, they're good at most of it, but having to do with something beyond uh, some good stuff, I'm not saying that. But they now have got guidance from someone that knows how to put some things together for them, and he's doing it. And we're really pleased with him. And, yes, the exact reason what Bill talked about in the U.S. trustee program and what I think the law envisioned was this counselor trustee. And so far, we've had this counselor trustee that not only helps the debtor, but helps the lawyer talk to the, the debtor. debtor. Yeah, I mean, yeah, Bill Brandt, I mean, look, uh, one of the very pleasant um, positive surprises for me has been the success of the facilitating trustee. And, the and you know, we kidded around a little earlier about um, you know, we tried to get this person not named the trustee. I, uh, that was the serious. We were actually trying to come up with a different name. But before that, I was when we were, you know, going back and forth on this legislation, I was trying not to have one. Um, it's not because I don't like trustees, but history has sort of told us in Chapter 11 that if you have a mandatory trustee, people avoid the chapter. And we were trying to make sure that wouldn't happen. Um, and so the, the trustee that we got was a compromise 
And I think, frankly, I'm, you know, I'm a convert. It, it, it has, it, I think actually the facilitating trustee is, has turned out to be a very good thing. It's one of the things that's making the statute work well. Um, that's really, I think, for two reasons. Credit to the U.S. Trustee's Office and how they embraced the intent of the statute and the concept of the consulting or facilitating trustee. And secondly, having embraced the intent of the statute, um, what an excellent job they did training their pools because uh, it's working. And, and, and I think it's working better because we have one than it would have if we hadn't. Okay. Now, now, will, now, Bill. Yeah, yeah Judge. If, you, if Bill Harrington can just do something about the dip financing at the banks, it, not dip financing, the debtor in possession account at the banks, because the banks don't like those anymore and these no, small businesses <laughs> really struggle. Well, so and, you and, can and, get and, that little and, issue taken uh, care of. Once again, I'll uh, defer to Congress uh, because we just apply the law as written by Congress on that on that issue. Um, but I will just say we were I was not as adversarial about trustees as uh, you all know. I I actually think trustees, even operating trustees, if you look statistically, those cases have done really well. So uh, we we were pleasantly surprised, but expected the trustee role to actually be a very uh, useful role in these cases. And then, Bill, I think well, the question I was going to ask you, many of the listeners may not realize it, but the legislation specifically excludes subchapter five debtors from paying quarterly U.S. trustees fees, which you know, is a surprise, but gets to the cost issue. So I, I worry if we raise the caps and there are too many cases, I'll you know, that the, the burden to fund the U.S. trustee system will fall on the big cases. But that's a, an argument for another day, right? Well, it is. It is. And, and I will say um, this is probably the one time, you know, you will find lawyers from the U.S. trustee program out promoting something where we don't get paid. You don't see lawyers doing that all that often. So um, I do have I do have one question from uh, one of the participants that wrote me beforehand. Uh, and I don't I'm not going to give an answer because I don't have it in front of me and I haven't decided on it. But is there any reason why a plan cannot provide for a single distribution to creditors in full satisfaction of the no, payment it, obligations oh. shortly after the effective date? No, you absolutely can. And it, but but more and I'll and I'll emphasize the point I made earlier. You can also pay out the net present value of the projected disposable income. And right? So let's assume. That, and you can do that in a lump sum and get a discharge right away, too. So we're at a distressed investor conference. And the very fact that that question popped up as I wrap up this session is the fact that if, if there are financiers who want to help plans get confirmed faster by putting the present value in, that kind of financing is something we'd be looking for, at least on this level of basis, right? Oh, sure. Look, I mean, just as you've had the emergence of, you know, what I, I wouldn't call the micro, but a much smaller range dip financing cases in regular 11s. You now see this, you've had the emergence of new lenders in the 500,000 to 10 million space. Um, you know, this is ripe for the, the introduction of those lenders, right? Not only for dip financing, because remember, this is a regular 11. You need either, if you have secure debt, you either need use of cash collateral or dip lending. And largely that'll come from your existing lender, but, it, but it's not written that it has to. Um, but but I do think, you know, there's, there's a market here, particularly in the sort of upper tier of these cases, for somebody to come in, provide dip financing, and then do an exit finance based on net present value of projected disposable income, for sure. Well, so let I, me make, Bill, Brent, let me make a, a clarification, because we had a question about the dip financing at the banks. It's not the dip financing at the banks. It's the fact that a debtor has to have a DIP account. The banks the bank. to do it. It's the, it's the, the changing banks, accounts issue that's a problem. It's, it's a changing accounts issue, and the banks are not receptive to it. As a matter of fact, many, many, many banks will not do it anymore. We'll so it's care not that the financing it's account. Yeah. Although, although that has changed in, in very recent times. We are yeah. seeing a few new entrants into that category that want to handle um, – debtor in possession funds now. So we are starting, hopefully, I hope we're turning the corner on that. And most banks are, there are new banks that want to be in um, holding deposits for debtor in possession accounts. And with that, I'm going to have to give Bill a last word because we're running out of time. I want to thank Judge Morris, the Chief Judge of the Southern District of New York, Bill Harrington, my good friend, who is the Regional Trustee for Regions 1 and 2, and Bob Keach, who is the author of some great legislation and a good friend 
for many years. Thank you all for doing this today. I think it was a great session. I appreciate it. Harold, are you? Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. So I'm tossing it back to Harold Kaplan if you're there. Unmute yourself, Harold. That's an, that's an unnatural status for you. <laughs> well, I always defer to you, Bill. Um, well, thank you, uh, Bill and group. That was a great session. Um, I could see, Bill, you start you s- turning this into a securitization, knowing your, uh, knowing, knowing your history. Um, but anyway, want to thank you again. This is really an eye-opening session. And hopefully, um, this last session of the day, hopefully people uh, enjoyed the conference today and got some benefit out of it. And hopefully you will all come back tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern time uh, as we have another great uh, d- session. Thank you. Appreciate it.